news now. Both Michigan and U.S. Senators voted to convict President Donald Trump of impeachment, and so did Michigan native and Republican Mitt Romney. But as we all know, the president was still acquitted. How will voters respond at the ballot box? And also, it's budget day in Michigan. It may sound boring, but it impacts almost everything that happens in your family. Joining us now is Oakland University professor David Dulio. Thanks for being here. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so let's talk about the Michigan budget a little bit first, because sure. why is it so important to people? Why should people not just say, oh, the budget, who cares? Uh, they're just going to fight about it. Why is it important to people? This is one of the first steps in the process for the state deciding how it's going to spend the people's money. Our this, tax dollars. Th this is your tax dollars at work, how they're going to get deployed throughout the state. What are some of the key places that the governor wants to spend the money? Well, it looks like uh, right off the top, education is a, a huge component of what she wants to bring to the table in terms of the, the fiscal year 2021 budget cycle. She's proposed uh, in a lot of different areas of the education component, uh, huge increases across the board. Well, some of those in uh, uh, pregnant women, uh, help for infants, uh, contraceptive things. Health and Human Services is another enormous chunk of that pie. Uh, we spend most of our money here in Michigan on Health and Human Services education. We also spend a, a good bit on, uh, on prisons, too. So the problem is there's not enough money to go all the way around, and decisions have to be made. There's, there's never enough money in the state budget, at least what's controllable or, or what's, um, what we could uh, have debate about. There's a lot of costs that are set that are uh, uh, non-negotiable, that are mandatory spending, and, and the size of the discretionary budget seems to shrink every year to almost to about $10 billion. And so what do the Michigan Republicans want to do with that? additional money or discretionary money? Well, I think we'll wait and see. Uh, as I said, this is the first step in this process. The governor will uh, has submitted her budget, and the Republican legislature will take it, and uh, they might adopt it, very unlikely, right? Uh, they might uh, throw it in the garbage can, likely somewhere in between. They'll take some of her suggestions, uh, do their own things with it. Uh, Republican priorities uh, are going to be Republican priorities at any point in time. Lower taxes, uh, controlled spending, uh, spending in certain areas, not others, etc. Uh, didn't the governor promise to do a few things uh, when she got into office mm -hmm. and, and aren't some of those uh, important now that she's presenting the budget? Absolutely. One of those is the uh, so-called pension tax repeal. Uh, this is something that, that the governor campaigned on. It's something that the Republican legislature uh, has supported, at least in theory. It was part of her budget proposal uh, last year, and it didn't go anywhere, in part because the uh, any offset like that, a, a getting rid of a, uh, of a tax, right, any tax increase, uh, people are going to want to see met uh, with spending reductions, or at least making it revenue neutral. neutral. And that's where the, the sticking point has been with Republicans. They didn't like last year her proposal to raise taxes in other areas, uh, a, a sales tax increase on, on a bunch of different things across the state, and, and that's where that fell apart. We'll see if they can get over that hurdle this time. So taxpayers, you know, they usually like to see elected officials get along and do what's best for right. everybody. But in this case, I mean, it may be very important that their, their representatives stick up for the things that are important to them. I think that, that partisans on both sides expect folks that, that are on their team, right, that are, that are co-partisans, to, to stick to their principles, absolutely. Let's talk about this impeachment vote. Sure. Uh, so uh, the president was acquitted, no mm -hmm. surprise to anybody. Nope. Um, the two senators from Michigan uh, voted to convict, which is also no surprise right. to anybody, right? Um, but how does that play out, if at all? Does the president punish states who have elected officials who went against him? He might try. And, and the president uh, thus far in his term of office has tried to um, do some things in states that maybe don't carry out his, his preferred policy alternatives. Uh, the, his, some of the things he's tried to do in California uh, as payback for, for that being a, uh, full of sanctuary cities, as he would say. But he's, he's not able to in a lot of ways because if it's, if it's tied to funding, uh, the, the Congress sets those rules and, and funds that are appropriated have to be spent. That's pretty clear. 
in in Michigan's case, they also had the governor do the response yeah. to the State of the Union. Right. Um, and it wouldn't surprise anybody if the president didn't care for what Gretchen Whitmer had to say. I, 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 he, she's not very high on his list right now, yeah. So if you follow the president, you kind of notice, uh, you know, he'll people come at him, he'll come back at them. Sure. You got two Michigan senators and a governor all kind of coming at the president. Do you think he does anything or does is Michigan so important in the next election that he really can't do much? I think it's both. I think it's it's really important and he's going to come here and it wouldn't surprise me that it, it, he would come here in the near future and hit back at Gretchen Whitmer and hit back at Gary Peters, Debbie Stabenow. And what do you think the voters reaction is or the people of Michigan's reaction when it comes to Gary Peters? So he's 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 going to be running. He's going to be running against John James. Right. And uh, people, it's not so clear. Like, it's not just we're all Democrats, we're all Republicans. That independent vote is really right. crucial to getting elected. And so the independent voters are either, they either didn't want the impeachment or maybe they did. How does that play out in such an important election uh, for, for Gary Peters and John James? Well, that, that remains to be seen. I think uh, John James will make this an issue. I think he's going to bring it up. I think he's going to uh, try and use it against Gary Peters. Gary Peters has got a new ad out on television already. It's his first ad of the cycle, um, and it's it's uh, it doesn't of course doesn't mention impeachment, but it it, it talks about uh, him delivering for the state and. James will quarrel with that as well. But, so impeachment is just going to be another one of those inflection points in that race. Uh, I think that uh, you talk about independents. They have generally kind of shrugged their shoulders at this whole impeachment thing. So I, I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal come uh, 2020. But will Donald Trump come in and say, hey, you know, uh, Gary Peters went after me. You need to throw him out of office. He, he'll do that at his rallies. Right. And and because that's red meat for the base. That is something that gets his supporters fired up. Uh, so I think it'll be deployed uh, in selective ways with the base. Yes. With trying to message to independent voters. Not at all. They're, they care about things like uh, health care, the economy. So he'll message on those things rather than impeachment. Mike Bloomberg is running for president mostly by airing millions of dollars worth of TV ads. Is it working? The Democrats seem to be making headway in several states, including Michigan. Joining us now to talk about that is Leonard Fleming of the Detroit News. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So he is spending some dough. He's opening up some offices. He's hiring some people. What What is going on out there on the streets when it comes to Bloomberg in Michigan? Yeah, so he's spending a lot of time here. I was just here yesterday to visit for the second time since he announced his candidacy. Uh, and as you pointed out, he spent uh, nearly $8 million here already on TV ads. So he's been on TV during the Super Bowl. He's been on TV during soap operas. You name it. He, every time you turn on the television, you see Michael Bloomberg. And that's what he wants. You know, he joined the race late um, in last November, and he hasn't been in one debate yet. But he's ubiquitous. He's, he's on t TV all the time. So people are starting to think, like, hmm, is, is he the one who could possibly face Trump in the fall, in part because of his money, and another part because of the perceived success as the mayor of New York. So what is he actually doing on the ground in Michigan? Are they, do they have a good team? Well, it looks like they have the start of a good team. You know, Joe Alper, longtime Democratic strategist, uh, is on the team. Jermaine Dickens, who's been a longtime political consultant and PR professional, is on the team. I know that they are bringing in um, 60 volunteers to try to recruit more around the state as well. So um, yesterday's appearance had about maybe two, 300 people there. But the folks that I talked to, they weren't necessarily on board yet. Even Warren Evans, who introduced him, called Wasn't back sure. to say, it's not an endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like an endorsement, but I'm just introducing him. I, I respect his skill set, and but I'm not quite on the team yet. So how important is it for Michael Bloomberg to spend time in Michigan and start meeting with folks like Warren Evans one-on-one -on -one, uh, to, to build those relationships? Oh, it's critically important. I mean, he needs to win this state and other states to have a shot because he skipped, as we know, New Hampshire, Iowa, South Carolina. So his strategy has been to win the key battleground states, the Super Tuesday states, and then the uh, Michigan primary a week later. So that, that's been his strategy, and we'll see if it works. I mean, it would be unprecedented 
for someone to come in and, and just completely skip right. the early states and then go for the battleground states. But he has the money to do it, and that's the wild card. Do you get the sense that people care that he hasn't been on a debate stage, or do you, do you think people are like, well, we'll see how he does when he gets there. We're in no hurry. Yeah. Um, the people I've talked to, they don't seem to care. Uh, most people are already in camps, right? But if you're a Democrat, you're thinking it's best to focus on beating Trump. So who's the best person to do that? So I think there are some Democrats and independents who are thinking, well, maybe it's someone like Bloomberg who hasn't been on stage, hasn't really been challenged yet, and has a lot of money, and has some successes as mayor of New York. Uh, why not give him a shot? And I think that's kind of where people are. So people are curious about his candidacy, and we'll see where it goes. Michigan's obviously a key state for who's going to be the next president. Where does Bloomberg stack up on issues important to Michigan? Where, where does he do well? Where does he not do so well? Jobs. I think he does extremely well. I think he will appeal to some of those Macomb County independents, possibly Republicans. Because remember, he was a Republican right. mayor for three terms in New York. Um, on the environment, so he'll pull in some environmentalists. You know, he mentioned the Great Lakes, caring about the Great Lakes yesterday. Uh, immigration issues, he's, he's also talked about. Um, and infrastructure, you know, it's a big deal. You know, Gretchen Whitmer talked sure. about infrastructure yesterday and her. Fix those roads. Her, fix those roads. So at this point, those are some of the bread and butter issues he's talking about. But, you know, he's also got some controversy, as we know, the stop and frisk policy, mm -hmm. which I wrote about a little bit on Monday in the piece I did on Bloomberg advancing his uh, visit to Detroit, a lot of minorities are concerned about that. I mean, well, let's, he, talk he, a, let's talk a little bit about yeah. that. So what was his policy in New York? Uh, was it successful, uh, but was yeah. it at a, a price that's way too steep? Well, right. I mean, it, bas <laughs> it basically was, you know, if you sus suspect someone, you authorize the police to stop and frisk them, and generally they were targeting African Americans. Uh, and it didn't go over well with the minority community. Now. There was a drop in crime, but urban crime was dropping all over the country. It wasn't right. just New York. So I, we can't really say quantitatively whether that actually had anything to do with stop and frisk. But yet, civil rights clearly were violated. People were upset. I think lawsuits were probably filed. And that came after the Amandu Diallo shooting, which right. I covered when I was at the Philadelphia Inquirer, where the four officers shot Amandu Diallo in, his, in the vestibule of his apartment building. So, you know, there were a lot of tension in, in New York. And, Bloomberg apologized for the stop and frisk, but it's when he's running for president. Right. So the credibility issue, it's like, does he really mean it? Or why didn't he apologize for it while he was mayor? You know, that's, that's the issue, I think, for a lot of urban minority voters. Is he really real? But yes, do people want to beat Trump? And is that their primary focus right now, to look the other way? Yes, I think that's is, helping. Is the issue in the urban areas is the number one issue safety and crime or jobs or maybe both maybe they're even um, but does he now have an answer to to solving those problems well I mean I think he's gonna just focus on his record in New York with the economic success he's had and I think that's really just the selling point for him I mean does he have the answer I mean the economy is humming right now but it's not humming for everybody particularly in urban areas. So people still need jobs, people still need opportunities, and discrimination is, discrimination is still rampant in, in hiring. And he mentioned that yesterday at the end of his speech, uh, talking about we need to you know, uh, basically uh, outlaw discrimination. And, and that's something that I think can resonate with people. So do you think he's got a shot of winning in Michigan against the other Democrats? I do, I think he has a very good shot. But this state is a wild card. I mean, it's a purplish state, as you know, Kevin. Oh, yeah. No. Right? So, you know, who knows how this is going to play out. I, I think it's going to depend on whether other candidates decide to spend time here. You know, Elizabeth Warren was the first candidate to have a presidential office in Michigan. Uh, Bloomberg's the second. No other, Buttigieg has not been here at all, right? <laughs> he's just, and he's from Indiana. He's a Midwestern guy. I would think that... Michigan would have been. They need part to Google Hillary Clinton in Michigan and <laughs> right, skip right. Michigan. It exactly. Not, it did not go well. Exactly. You, you it, need to get to right. Michigan. And, and Bernie know. Sanders is kind of taking it for granted, like he'll probably win this again. And I know he has a lot of supporters here, but right. you need to spend time on the ground. So I think in the next three weeks, we're going to see uh, Bloomberg swoop in and swoop out of here.
and he has the money and the, and the resources to do so. And the fact that he's saying that he's he's really all focused on Super Tuesday, he's actually focused on Michigan right. as well, which is a week later. Which is a week later, exactly. All right. I hope you'll come back soon. Thanks for I coming. I will love to be here. All right. Awesome. Thank you. We'll be back with more news now after this. Welcome back. Joining us now is political strategy consultant Rashini Rajkumar, who is here in the nick of time to coach up some flailing politicians. Rashini, thanks for joining us. Oh, my gosh. What a week it's been, Kevin. It has been unbelievable. There's so much to talk about. Uh, but first, uh, you've been monitoring uh, President Donald Trump. Uh, people were kind of wondering, and maybe not wondering too much, uh, what he might do after the uh, impeachment hearing was finally over, which it is now. Uh, you listened to him today. Uh, what was the tone of, of the president? Well, let's just say election 2020 is definitely on. I mean, he's basically giving the finger to a lot of people. He has his full arsenal of what he does best out and about, not only on stage in the acquittal response today, but already you may have seen it on Twitter or elsewhere. There's an ad campaign that attacks Romney for being the one Repu Republican vote against him on one of the articles of impeachment. It brings in other video from the past. It is definitely clear that that ad was like getting ready to go as soon as that vote was done on Wednesday. So when you look at the different words that he said and the kind of his body language, how excited he is and celebratory, he said, this isn't a press conference. It's not a speech. This is a celebration. That's what he said today. And he was specifically calling out certain Republican members of the Senate, as well as his legal team getting applause for them. I mean, if this isn't a campaign speech, I don't know what is. This is definitely a rally, and he is basking in what he's probably calling the glory of the acquittal, but he definitely named names. He named Comey. He named Mueller. He called, said dirty cops, so a lot of references uh, to some negative images that he wants to put on the Democrats. So he's clearly in attack mode, which is a place he's fairly comfortable. Uh, do you think that this is the best way to go uh, for President Donald Trump uh, at this point? Could he have taken the high road and won over more independence, or does he just stay with what he knows and attack, attack, attack? I don't know if it was the best way to go. I would not have coached him to do this, but if you really pick apart, is he playing to his strengths and his authenticity? Absolutely. He'll continue to rally his supporters, maybe go deeper with them, perhaps pick up some independents who are disgusted with Nancy Pelosi's behavior the night of the State of the Union, as well as other things. But, you know, I looked up what was the immediate reaction by Bill Clinton after he was acquitted of those impeachment charges, and he said he was profoundly sorry for his behavior and what it imposed on Congress and the American people. So that was a completely different reaction, obviously very different kinds of articles of impeachment, but a very different reaction. Uh, this is not the acquittal response I would have scripted, but he is playing to his strengths. President Trump is absolutely rallying as many Republicans as he can out there, and he's really trying to paint the picture of the Democrats as people who want to slow down the country and the economy. Let's get some of your coaching help for Nancy Pelosi, okay? The, the State of the Union, uh, she seemed distracted, disinterested. She was looking away. Uh, she was reading papers. Uh, just about anything other than paying attention to the president, it seemed. And then at the end, for the grand finale, just ripped up the script. Um, I'm, it didn't play well, so I'm guessing you would not have coached her to do that, but it is done. So how would you coach her at this point? Yeah, let me just say that was disgusting to see the Speaker of the House, a female Speaker of the House at that. You know, that is the image that's going to live on. So any legacy Nancy Pelosi may have had before that had a positive element is now going to be so wiped out in a lot of Americans' eyes by that visual. I would have coached her. I mean, she started by offering the president her hand at the beginning. It looked like he wouldn't shake it. But instead of having kind of that get-back attitude and th those terrible looks on her face during the talk. 
She should have held with poise. She can be a very elegant woman. She should have then, you know, sh shaken, shook his hand afterward, whatever, definitely not ripped, ripped up that speech. But now to sort of come back and she herself is saying in a way the gloves are off for her until Election Day. So we have full battleground going, Kevin. Yeah, and, uh, you know, she had said that, uh, you know, nobody's above the law when it came to President Donald Trump. And now people are saying, well, wait a minute, did she break the law or uh, was there an ethics violation? Do you think the Republicans are going to go after her and try and make her accountable for that? Oh, I'm sure they will, and as they should. I mean, it was just un unbecoming. Look, I've been one of the critics of the non-presidential behavior by Donald Trump. This was non executive behavior, non-speaker of the House behavior by Nancy Pelosi. So bad behavior des deserves to be called out by your own party, by the opposite party. Uh, I just am very saddened, though, Kevin, as I've shared with you in the past, for our country and for our very democracy when these office holders are not remembering who their bosses are. And that's the American people. It's not to fight with the other party. Mitt Romney is in the spotlight now, his historic uh, vote to convict, uh, the first time someone has voted to convict someone of their own party. Uh, he basically came up and, and owned it and said, this is what's in my heart. Uh, you know, I'm convicting on one article, but not the other. Uh, is he handling it well? And what's he have to do going forward now that he's got a target on him? Well, I think he has to just continue to own what he did, but I don't know that he should do any grandstanding or any more speeches about it. I mean, if it, it is what it is, whether he wanted to make history by doing what he did, you know, that's up to him and his heart. But now he just needs to move on and continue to be a member of the Senate and hopefully can bring some clarity to the Senate as well as just cross-party relations. And Joe Biden, is uh, he going to be able to recover from this uh, fourth-place finish in Iowa? What's he need to do quickly to turn it around? Well, Joe Biden, I just think he continues to bumble around, Kevin. You would think someone like that, who everyone at some point was saying, that's the guy who's going to get the nomination, for him to come out of Iowa in this way. And to me, it was very shady that those results – the Iowa poll last week, the Iowa caucuses were so bungled up on Tuesday, on Monday night, and we still don't have final, final results. Uh, you would think that he can't really recover from this. I don't think you can throw money at this issue, Kevin. That is really my sense of it. But we shall see, as you know, in politics, anything can go.